Jonah chapter 4. I had a hard time putting a title on this. In fact, I had Marcia to help me because I just could not come up with one that didn't sound bizarre. <laughs> and so this great title came from her suggestion. So if you want to thank her for it, feel free to do so. I already have, and another time would be good. Hard lessons for adults. As we've gone through this book, I think we've noticed something this would be a very difficult book to teach to our young people over there. Let me give you a couple of examples that I thought of from last week and again this week. To a child, five, six, and seven, how do you explain to them that a, an adult, a man of God, would run away from God? What could be going on in the heart and mind of an adult to think they could run far, far away and hide from God. And I think a teenager would look at that story and say, you know what, there's something about this that sounds awfully familiar. I, I remember another guy who had a name, Simon, son of Jonah. And he too had a very difficult time being sent to preach to Gentiles. I wonder if there's a connection. But as you grow older, you realize we have met a lot of people our age and a little younger who've tried to run away from God and it, it didn't work. And so eventually we stopped and said, you know what, enough of this. We turned around, we repented and started working with instead of against our Lord, which makes chapter one easier for adults. Chapter two is tough. Because how do you explain that? How do you justify? How do you rationalize? How do you take the rest of the scripture and interpret a man dead three days and three nights in the stomach of a great fish and then suddenly alive? Well, that's easy. You just go to the Gospels and listen to Jesus explain. <laughs> that's what the sign is. Resurrection. Chapter 3, a little tougher. What would make a city repent so dramatically with one simple, one sentence sermon? In 40 days, you will be overthrown. Now, we suggested last week that maybe the Ninevites understood this Yahweh, this God of Jonah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how he in the past has overthrown cities. Two on the same day, Sodom and Gomorrah, violently. And if the historians are correct that Nineveh could stand for the Assyrian Triangle, three cities combined with one name, what would keep Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty, from destroying all three and one. So we're going to repent. We're going to put on sackcloth and ashes, and we're going to show this God that we have repented. Which brings us to chapter 4, verse 1. If you'll turn, please. Follow along. We'll do something we rarely do, and that's read the text in context from beginning to end. Verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please, Take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant 
and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day, God prepared a worm, and so it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It's better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, Is it right for me to be angry even to death? But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Now try to teach that to a five-year-old. Why on earth would Jonah be so angry? Now, he gives us a hint in the opening verses, which is why we read from Joel this morning. If you have a reference Bible, you'll see that verse 2 in Jonah 4.2 corresponds with Joel 2, which we read this morning. You'll also notice in other reference Bibles, these same words are used in Numbers and in Exodus to describe the name of God. So Jonah is aware of the character of God. He is not oblivious to who God is. And so he says in verse 2, didn't I tell you? <laughs> Can you imagine being a man saying to God, I told you. I want you to know, I want you to listen up, Lord. I knew you would do this. I knew you'd go to those Ninevites and you'd forgive them and you would relent. And I am ticked. Why? Why was he so upset that God would do exactly what Jonah knew he would do? Was he that prejudiced against the Ninevites? that he would be angry with God for forgiving them for their repentance and show them mercy? Why would he go up to the east side of the town, which is further away from Jerusalem than the west, and sit there and pow, you know, I just die. God did exactly what I said he would do, and I just I mean, mumble, 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 mumble. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds awfully familiar. And God says to Jonah and some of us, why are you so angry? Why are you showing more pity for this thing, this plant, than the people? Sound familiar? Why do we get more upset that our car died on Highway 89 than we are with people who are dying every day without Jesus because now we have to walk home they're on their ooh boy we better not go too far with this should we so we need to take a look at this and see what is really going on because certainly Nineveh responded according to what they knew about God or what they thought they knew I'm going to suggest they repented almost instantly and totally because they knew from the oral transmitting of the acts of God all the way to Nineveh that he from heaven can destroy a town if he chooses to and it will be dramatic. Sackcloth and ashes, guys. The, whole, the king made an edict, a proclamation, a decree. Even put sackcloth on the cows and the sheep and your pets, because we don't want God to kill them either. We don't want him to come down and destroy us and everything around us. So they acted upon what they knew. 
Jonah did too, in a way. He went and preached, but he did it his way. You have 40 days. Can you imagine standing over there in front of Walgreens? You have 40 days. You have 40 days. Turn or burn. Eh, eh, eh. Sir, you need to remove yourself. You're causing a traffic jam here. Why would we say such a thing? Jonah was told to say something like that. He was told to go preach to Nineveh, that God was upset with him, them, that the stench of Nineveh was reaching heaven, and they needed to repent, or God was going to do something about that. So he just made it very plain. You have 40 days. Now some scholars think that Jonah went to the east side of the city and he sh sat in the sun day after day counting the days. 38, nothing. 39, nothing. 40, we're getting close. Nothing. 41, Nothing. 42, I'm just going to die. I'm not so sure. I think he went to the east side of the city on day one, the same day he preached. I'm not positive. But I think he went up there to see what Nineveh was going to do. Not what God was going to do, because he already knew that God would relent. He knew that because Moses told him that in Exodus 34, and again in Numbers. And the prophet Joel had repeated that. So he's not ignorant of the word of God to the world. I am gracious, I am merciful, I am long-suffering. Which, by the way, if you missed yesterday, guys, were some of the characteristics of a godly man we wrote on the whiteboard. And we're looking at that list going, there is no way. In fact, a guy said to me this morning, if that, and we had, I don't know how many words we had up on that board, 30, 40, 30? There's no way. Well, there's only one way. And that's for the transformation of God through his spirit. That we can become even close to that, being conformed to the image of God. So not only did we have a really nice breakfast, and by the way, the guys who made that, thank you. But we had a very enlightening conversation about what it means to reveal the characteristics of God to the rest of the world by being loving and forgiving. Which means I need to disconnect the horn in my car. <laughs> so it at least appears to the public that I'm being less anxious about me. But let's look at some of the applications of what we can do here. Here are some possible reasons that Jonah was so angry. Firstly, as a prophet, possibly he was humiliated that God did not destroy the city, which he just told, you have 40 days. Maybe he went up there to sit and he expected God to destroy him in 40 minutes. And when he didn't, he was embarrassed. Now, some think that's possible because this is not the first time Jonah had been sent to a king to prophesy to him from what the Lord has said. He, in 1 Kings, it's recorded that he was sent to Jeroboam to tell that king who was evil that if he were to change, God will give the boundaries back to Israel. And Jeroboam did repent. So God did what he promised. And then Jeroboam retracted and became one of the most evil kings of Israel. So he'd already gone through it once. And he didn't want that embarrassment again. So think some people. Secondly, it's possible, and some suggest this, that as a Jewish person, as a descendant of Abraham, as a Hebrew, he was ashamed that God would forgive the enemy of Israel. 
Maybe that's why he went to Tarshish in the first place. I'm not going to those people. They hate my Lord. They hate my country. They hate me. I'm not walking in the midst of them. Well, God changed his mind, right? And maybe he was embarrassed, ashamed. Thirdly, maybe he was embarrassed that God actually forgave them. He said, you have 40 days or you're going to be overthrown. Maybe. He was feeling really low because he said one thing and God did the other. And deep down, he knew God was capable of that. I'm looking out over my friends and your faces and I'm thinking, how many times have we prayed for something and when God didn't do it our way, we went... Okay, I'll ask again, God. And he doesn't do it our way the second. Okay, I will be persistent, and I will ask again. Lord, are thou us going to destroy us? We even change our vocabulary a bit, huh? Thinking this might get his attention. And we become somewhat ashamed that his ways are not our ways. And he is saying to us in that quiet voice of his, you trust me? Yes. Then trust me. Okay. But, no, there are no buts. I know this sounds familiar because I've had some conversations with some of you across the table next door. There's some of us so upset with what's going on, we would like a little vengeance. Am I getting close? We like a few things to happen. Maybe some hailstones of fire and brimstone in Washington, D.C. would be just right for today. Don't say amen, because God's ways are not our ways. So we have to be patient because he is patient. We need to be long-suffering because he is. I'm beginning to think, friends, that too many of us in this room have been praying for patience lately. <laughs> Ring a bell? And God's saying to us, you want patience? Yes, I think I do. You're patient, and so I want it to. Okay, let's see. Too many of you are praying to be more loving. Oh, you want to be more loving? Well, let's see. So God's putting in our path people for, for whom we have no patience and the most unlovable people you can imagine going through all those things on that silly highway. Don't anybody know how to drive anymore? And God's saying, Nolan, you asked to be patient. There you go. Fourthly, perhaps he was resentful that God actually would pardon sinners. Now this is why I entitled this for adults only. A youngster wouldn't comprehend this attitude that some of us have and we need to be sorry for and repentful for. I think some of us, I'm not going to mention any names, but I'd be on this list, grow a little bit upset with God because how Dare he forgive that person? That person doesn't deserve forgiveness. I don't think their confession was good enough. I'm going to go talk to that person again because I'm not convinced they really believed in their heart what they said with their mouth. So I'm going to go talk to him or her again and again and again until I'm sure they deserve God's forgiveness, and then God can forgive them if he wants to. Sound familiar? Yes, it does. This, too, will be part of our discussion come Friday. It will be a very interesting and educational conversation because what we're going to suggest by our fellowship there on that day is this. Begin your evangelism where you're the most comfortable of beginning and or 
where the conversation with the other person is leading you to begin. Do you see the connection? For example, if you're convinced that a confession cannot be genuine unless the person to whom you are speaking knows what sin is and what it has done in their life, then start with that. Perhaps Romans 3.23 and 6.23. Start with those verses or ones like it so that you're confident that they understand what sin is and what it's done and how they're dead spiritually without it. Or you could start with one of the Ten Commandments as become popular these days. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, no. Oh, that's right. I did take ballpoint pens from work one day. Does that count? Does it count? Yes. Yeah, it counts. Did I take an itemization on my tax return I probably shouldn't have taken? Don't say anything. <laughs> and God is saying to that person, you're a sinner. Well, what has that done? That has separated them from a very holy and righteous God. Begin where you're comfortable beginning. Today... Coincidentally, Dwayne, we sang three songs in a row that has the gospel right in them. Jesus was, he died and he was glorified. Remember seeing that over and over again? That's right out of the Bible. That's right out of the gospels. Jesus died for our sins and he was glorified. He was resurrected for our life. So if you don't know where to begin, begin with that song. You know that Jesus died and was glorified for us? What? What? Start with what you're comfortable with and allow God to work in their heart. What Jonah is saying to us as adults is this. God doesn't work like we expect him to. In fact, he has a habit, or maybe I'm speaking just for myself, of working very differently than how I expect him to. He is more patient than we ever thought about being. And he will suffer long for somebody to make sure they have the time they need to repent. Maybe you can help me coming this Friday with a verse that substantiates my theory that nobody passes from this earth until they've had multiple chances to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that's my feeling about God's patience and his loving kindness, that nobody will die until they've had plenty of opportunities to believe. Because unless they do, there's no chance. This is the chance. When we take our last breath here, the chances are over. There is no second chance. There's no dying and then coming back for a second chance. It's done. It's over with. Because God is loving and he wants none to perish. Which brings us to the fifth reason that some people suggest that maybe Jonah loved God so much that it bordered on too much. I had to read that three times, that maybe John, Jonah loved God so much that he loved him too much. That he was so jealous of God's love for him that he didn't want to share that with anybody else. I love you, Lord. It's a great hymn. But we, when we sing it to be exclusive, I love you, Lord, they're on their own. I love you, Lord. It's up to them to decide. I love you, Lord. And when God says, do you love me? Then keep my commandments. Oh, really? Go talk to that person. Go 
So share your faith with that person. Because time is getting short. I didn't plan to do this, but I think I will. By a show of hands, how many in this room think time is getting short? I think just about everybody raised their hand up at least a little bit. We're not exactly sure, are we? Because our Lord said nobody knows the day and the hour. But we certainly know the signs of the times and the seasons. So if we're seriously thinking time is short and the time is shorter for our friends because some of them are so ill, their time may be later today. We don't know how God works. So maybe this is why he went to the east side of Nineveh because he wanted to see just how long it was going to take for Nineveh to return to their old ways. This won't last, God. This will be short-lived, God. Oh, they say they believe and they say they've repented, but you just give them a few minutes and I'll be proven right. They didn't deserve your mercy because they were lying to you. All their actions were very serious. I mean, they did put on sackcloth. They did sit in ashes and throw dust on their hair. Yeah, I know what they did, but it's not real. You just wait a little longer, Lord God, and they will prove themselves to be unrepentful. And maybe that's why he got mad. It appeared to be sincere. And he didn't know how. He wasn't prepared. He wasn't prepared to handle that his enemy, the Ninevites, would actually listen to him and heed the call of God to repent. How dare they? And they did. Now, you know, because you know the rest of the Bible, it didn't last a long time. Well, it lasted 150 years. That's a fairly long time before Nineveh became the hand of God against whom? Israel. Now, there's an irony. Jonah, an Israelite, goes to Nineveh, preaches, they repent, and God says, okay, that's good. They go back to their old ways eventually. Meanwhile, the Israelites over here are doing what they do time and time again. They're worshiping false gods. Okay, says God, I'll bring these people over here and I'll punish them with those. Explain that to a five-year-old brain. Mean God would do that? Well, clearly he did. Which suggests what? That's a very good reason for you to witness very sincerely to somebody you really don't like. Because it may be them that God uses to come to you when you're having a very dark day and say to you, don't you remember what you told me? What? that God loves me. Did he stop loving you? No. Well, then what's your problem? This is why we didn't invite ladies to yesterday's breakfast. Men don't talk to men like girls. Well, we don't. Maybe you do, but we don't think you do. (laughs) We're pretty straightforward. We're pretty blunt. And sometimes this gets us in trouble, but most of the times it gets us out of trouble. For example, ladies, I'm going to tell you something you think you know, but it's true. Two men could be at odds with each other. I mean at odds with each other, on the verge of fisticuffs. And all of a sudden, these two guys can realize, and they can say to the other, are we good? We're good. It's done. And your ladies are going, wait just a minute. It's not done yet. (laughs) Because they haven't proven that they're really sorry. 
Am I stepping on any toes, gals? I've heard this more than once. A couple could be having some trouble, and the guy can say to me in front of his wife, I said I was sorry. And she says what? Not yet. <laughs> now he misinterprets that. He thinks she means you're not sorry because I haven't made you miserable enough to be really sorry. That's not what she meant, did she, ladies? No. What she meant by that was, you have said this before. Show me that you're sorry. And that's what we expect of others in a general relationship. This is what we accept, expect from God. God, show me that you love me. And guess what? He did. He loved us so much, he sent his son to pay the very high price of our sins. And by his blood, we were redeemed, purchased, justified, forgiven. And he said to us, all I require of you is to believe on my son. Which brings another point we're going to talk about on Friday. What does that really mean? To believe on the name of Jesus. Because that's what the Bible says. For as many who believe on his name shall be saved. What does that mean? We're going to discuss that Friday. And when you leave, you'll go, oh, I, I've heard that. Yeah, okay, I see. Because we're going to bring out the scriptures that prove that very point. So you can confidently say to somebody when they say, do you believe in Jesus? They go, yes. That they do because you've had that conversation with them. And when they say to you, well, there's some certain things I need to do first. There's certain things I need to do first. Now you need to think very carefully on how you say, like what? Don't use my method. Use yours. Like what? What are these things that are so urgent that you can't confess Jesus right now? Well, I need to what? Well, I read this book which says there's three steps. I need to do those three. Okay. What does the Bible say? How many steps are there in the Bible? Well, this other book said there's seven. This other book said there was 22. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. Get out a pencil and paper, and I'll give you 49. And the fifth one is the one I want you to do. Believe on Jesus Christ. Because he's the one who came to show you how much God loves. I want to conclude, Jonah, with these observations that I made, and you can verify if you wish. We think at times that we know God well enough to question his will. We don't. Secondly, we think we know ourselves well enough to change ourselves. We don't. Thirdly, we sometimes think that mercy and grace allows us to sin more and more and more. That grace might abound. I can see by the faces on some of you, no, we don't. We, some, think that converts are like babies. They need years and years and years to mature. They need pablum, and then they need soft foods. And they need to learn how to crawl and then walk. You see where I'm going with this? That's not in the Bible. Not at all. Paul preached in the town of Ephesus two years. And before he left, he had Timothy appoint elders in the city of Ephesus. Two years. In essence, he's saying to the guys there, grow up. 
Take charge. Be a leader. Study the Word of God. Know the Word of God. Quote the Word of God. Be in charge. Take responsibility. Sounds a lot like a dad to his son, doesn't it? Eventually, dads, didn't we say to our child, especially the males in our family, grow up. Yeah, I know they're 40. <laughs> now, we didn't say that to them when they were four months old. You know, you could help your mom out if you changed your own diaper. <laughs> but eventually we said to our child, it's time to be a man. Now, some of us were raised on farms where I, that came very young, did it not? We weren't given to age 13, 14, 15 to grow up. We were given to age about six, seven, or eight when we were behind a wheel on a tractor. Now, I wasn't raised around horses, but some of you were. How young were you when you put on horseback the first time? Were you 13? I don't think so. So God is saying to the men that belong to the church, you don't need decades to grow up. You need minutes. Seconds even. You need as long as it takes to say to God Almighty, I recognize that I've been filled by your Holy Spirit. Change me, O oh God. Conform me to your Son. You've given me a new heart. Change my mind. That was number three on our list. Number one was love God. We're talking about the characteristics of a godly man. Number two was fear God. And number three was follow the Holy Spirit. That's how long it takes, gentlemen, to grow up, to be mature, to be a leader at home, at work, in this church, or wherever God sends you to be. Fifthly, Jonah was not prepared for what God was going to do. So Jonah is saying to us, by virtue of his lifestyle, be prepared for the unexpected when it comes to God. Remember when I asked you how many thought times were short and we ought to get busy? Well, what if it's another thousand years? Are we going to stomp around? Well, I thought you were going to destroy him in 2024. I'm just going to die. Can't take any more of this. What's that flag doing on our Capitol building in Washington, D.C.? I'm going to stomp around and I'm going, see what I mean? Expect God to do the unexpected, for his ways are not our ways. How far above our ways are his? Way up there. Sixthly, some people expect God to be patient until we get around to obeying him. Some think we are to be imploring him of God's long suffering until we get around to serving him. Some of us think, well, my hair isn't white enough yet to go do that, to do this. Or just as bad, I've already done it once. I've already served my time in Sunday school. Let somebody else do it. Really? If God's telling you that, so be it. But if he isn't, the three days and three nights on a belly of fish might be in your future. <laughs> because God is patient, but time is not, is it? Time doesn't wait for anybody, nobody. Now, all of the older people in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're like me, when you're getting ready to come here this morning, you're standing in front of the mirror and you're going, what happened? <laughs> Where did that guy go? Where did this guy come from? Or you see somebody you haven't seen in a long time and they're a whole lot older 
than you expected them to be. Like Andrew, Ellen's son, who came Friday from Montana. Well, not exactly. He lives in Montana, but he's here visiting his dad. Heard about Rabbi Zimmerman going to be here and showed up. I looked at Andrew and I go, where did that time go? He's not a little boy anymore. He's a grown man. Time doesn't wait for anybody. Lastly, if you're sitting under your shade tree thinking, you know what? This is comfortable. Another glass of iced tea and I'll make it through today. Expect God to say, and you're going, hey, Oh, you pity the shade tree and not the souls that are dying? Not the 120,000 who don't know their left from their right? Now, most scholars think those are children who are not yet old enough in a town that big to know right from left. Now, I sarcastically open with 120,000 who don't know their right from the left being just that worldly. Maybe the scholars are right. But there's a lot of people out there who will not see tomorrow who need to know Jesus today. You may meet one of those at the restaurant this afternoon. Be generous. Be gracious. Be humble in the sight of the Lord and let him lift you. Amen. Yeah.